Um, I want to say that to sort of set the tone, um, uh, we're not like a health select committee, which is a very robust affair, and you know it's a lot of questions and answers and that. Uh, we're seeing this much more as a conversation, mm -hmm. so it's really up to you to tell us what you want us to hear, okay. uh, and we're here to learn yeah. um, and to take on board what you're, you're telling us. And um, we know who you are, because we've got <laughs> name plates here. Yes. So um, I imagine, Jemima, you're going to speak first. If that's okay, yeah, that's I will. And, and thank you for the email, sir. Oh, very oh no, no, not thank at all. We, we, at last we're having our voices heard. We've, we've been campaigning for a very long time. And, you know, and I feel that we all really deeply appreciate this, all of us. So, um, I want to read things to you because I've got a really dreadful memory and quite often I get quite muddled up. So, um, you know, I'd rather, what I will do, I will read out my uh, whole statement because Dan and I wrote our statement separately and so overshadowed and I don't want us to, to repeat mm. everything. Um, Dennis's presentation has got a lot of what happened to me purely because it leads to n knowledge of what is happening right across the country. Um, so if I may, I'm going to stand up mm. and, and read a little of what I've written. Okay. Yes. And can I say, if you sort of feel you've had enough of something, you can always take your testimonies. You. Yes. Yeah, yeah, I've, I've um, got some separate ones. Mine I've highlighted and scribbled on, but I've got some separate ones that, that will be um, legible, hope, hopefully, anyway. So, um, so yeah. So... Firstly, I would like to thank you, um. Baroness Cumberledge and Sir, Sir Cyril Chancellor and the rest of the team um, for coming down to Wales. Um, I'd like to say that we were all deeply upset that there was no official support at that meeting, either from the Welsh Cabinet Health Secretary Vaughan Gethin or from the Women's Health Implementation Group, WIG, uh, despite your and our invitation to them to attend. Uh, we are shocked and deeply disappointed that a meeting so important regarding the future safety of patients in Wales, especially considering the serious nature of our injuries, has been ignored by the very people that should be protecting us. Um, your call for evidence should have actually been made mandatory because more patients then would have come forward for the whole uh, spectrum um, of the, of the um, things that you are. We believe that that was a serious waste of government money, that it wasn't made mandatory. Um, and a waste of time, your time, and effort, and taxpayers' money, because it should have been made mandatory. So, in Wales, we need, well, all across the UK, we need to see urgent action for, for treating mesh injured patients cross-border funding for people living in Wales and in the rural parts of, you, of the UK um, where they are unable to get to the places of clinical expertise, um, which actually not one of us in Wales has seen come to fruition as yet, although as a direct result of our work with the Welsh Government, uh, with the help of Scottish mesh survivors and with the help of global mesh survivors, we've actually um, the Welsh government has paid attention to us, and Vaughan Gething has set aside a million pounds. He set up 
the Women's Health Implementation Group um, in order to uh, carry forward the recommendations that Welsh mesh survivors and Welsh global mesh survivors have uh, made, made to them. Um, we need access to uh, surgeons that are experienced to deal with our own particular problems wherever they may be in the UK. We urgently need expertly trained surgeons with access to updated equipment such as translabial and ultrasound scans. Hernia and rectopexy patients must have access to treatment urge urgently as well as pelvic mesh injured women. There is horrific suffering with no other option for patients than surgical mesh if they have a problem, um, has a, a, a prolapse rectum and a hernia and his only option in Wales has been for him to have hernia mesh and a star uh, repair, um, which <laughs> causes horror to our family because of what, what I've been through and what I'm going through even after 16 years. Um, we are very pleased to see the NICE guidelines have uh, urged that these translabial scans and etc should be made available. I hope they'll be made available on the NHS immediately. Um, many mesh survivors own personal experiences that they are far more successful in visualising the mesh which is not actually MRI opaque. Uh, we also, I've said, we also need expertly trained radiographers with the skills to be able to read them. At present in Wales, due to a freedom of information um, that I sent off, we've been told that there is only one 2D scanner available to, um, to for these translabial scans and only one expert that can read them. Um, as you've all heard, there are many people suffering in the UK today. We need urgent financial help. Many have had to give up their jobs. Many relationships are broken. Some mesh survivors are very, very young and have young families and they're being left in wheelchairs and some can't afford the, these wheelchairs they, they, and there's no access to funding and they're now unable to earn money for themselves in order to buy them. Um, Benefits assessors are forever patient shaming. We've had this experience. I went myself. This has really got to stop and somebody needs to stand up and help us in this because our injuries are so taboo and it's very difficult. My assessor was meant to have been a male Luckily, he was away that day, and so I was assessed by a female, and she was absolutely horrible. Anyway, what I'd like to say next, I think, is most important for all mesh survivors. What about the children? Mesh survivors are extremely worried about the, f the effect that our serious health problems are having on our children, even the young adult children. We do not believe that there has been enough attention paid to this. We have heard that families have been broken apart and some very young children have been taken into care. The emotional and mental strain on the whole family is appalling and there is often a complete lack of understanding by health professionals and there's no support. 
We feel that the children and partners need support through expert counselling. Here are a few quotes from some of the children of MESH survivors. A 20-year-old student daughter, whom everyone was, thought was coping very well, despite her mother being told to prepare her children for her death. Every time I think of my graduation day, I cry. I am worried that you will not be around. I need you, Mum. How will I know and learn what to do when I have a baby of my own? A nine-year-old son. I hate my mother. Why can't she just be brave? I don't want her to come to my school with a walking stick. A 20-year-old son, suffering with severe depression, locked in his room for the last two years, submitted a very eloquent letter to the review team. And at the end, he says, I doubt whether my mother will be around to meet my children. And his reminder of the earliest Hippocratic Oath, first do no harm, and his appeal to the review team to do the right thing. MESH survivors, patient advocates, hear heartbreaking testimonials from Welsh sisters and brothers and of their families all too often. Better understanding of the effect on families is needed and counselling must be made available to all of those affected. We want answers, but more importantly, we want urgent action to be taken in order to help patients now. It, bear with me for just one moment. Um, MESH survivors would like to ask the question, why hasn't the, the use of hernia mesh and rectopexy mesh been investigated by the, government, by the UK government? The Scottish, Health, the Scottish Cabinet Health Secretary, the, the present one, has recently announced plans to do so. What about the rest of the UK? Please, all of you, remember our children's words. First, do no harm. This is a global medical health disaster. Most mesh survivors want to see a complete ban on the use of surgical mesh implants. We feel that any research, any new research, should be carried out on willing patients who have already undergone a surgical mesh implant operation with lifelong follow-up. Expert treatment should be urgently made available to us all. As you know from reading the recent random FDA reports that we sent in as part of Welsh Mesh Survivor experience, people are coming forward to re report these adverse events up to 18 years after the implant surgery has been taken place. I am still awaiting adverse events reports from the MHRA. My, FO, my freedom of information request has hitherto been ignored. In our view, the MHRA are not fit for purpose. In the recent NICE, um, guidelines that the new recent they they say that they will con you know to, well con consider the division of mesh slings for women with voiding dysfunction it still leaves the mesh in situ which will grate and cut and slice 
and the same must be said for a partial removal. I've experienced all of these things. We all know that a failed mesh implant can lead to a hardened, to hardened, broken pieces of mesh being embedded, grating and cutting and slicing into pelvic organs, into the vagina, the rectum, and, and erosion occurs, and it may become embedded in spinal tissue, which is what has happened to me. And now, allow me, if you will, to give you an analogy. Say you had a major car accident with a milk cart and ended up with a broken milk bottle left deep inside you. And when one centimetre of glass migrated and was poking through your vaginal wall, your surgeon says to you, don't worry, or into your rectum, you know, this, this men and women, hernia mesh, don't worry, we'll trim off that part and we'll give you some cream, some oestrogen cream and we'll make a plaster over that with your natural tissue and you'll be fine. The milk bottle is still inside you. It's still cutting you, it's still grating, it's causing such extreme pain that people attempt suicide. Some people attempt suicide. I almost jumped off a cliff in 2005. It was only the thought of my children and it was only hearing children behind me playing in the field that brought me back to think, oh my God, what will my children do and what will my husband do? We've got seven children between us. My youngest was age four when I had my implant. I can't say anymore, I'm sorry. No one is thinking about this sensibly, logically or compassionately. It's not about a little bit of pain. Please go on to YouTube. There is a discussion between CMO Sally Davis and Jeremy Hunt. And they talk about pelvic mesh. And this will be the last I say now because I, I really, I really, uh, I'm at the end of. So, CMO Sally Davis and former Cabinet Health Secretary, Jeremy Hunt. They talk about us as though we are cattle, these women. Some have pain, but some women can benefit. Complication rates are 15 to 20%. And I'm thinking one in 15 women that have mesh implants, one in 15 have to have mesh removal. That's the NHS own figures. So then Sally Davis goes on to say, if you have a good surgeon, and I mean a good surgeon, we all thought we had a good surgeon. She then goes on to say, and if you have the right patient, we were all told that we were the right patient to have this operation. And then they talk about consent. Mesh survivors are not just talking about pain. We are talking about pain that leads some people to commit suicide. Some have a high risk of sepsis. I've been told this, I've been offered a colostomy. I don't want a colostomy. I want to be able to live my life. Then they go on to talk about consent. Mesh survivors 
and are she interested in being consented to these operations in, in future patients being consented mesh survivors mostly all of them want to see a ban on this we don't want future patients to have to go through what we have gone through and consent is all about protecting the surgeon it's not about protecting the patient because even if you are consented it doesn't mean you're not going to feel pain after it doesn't mean that you're not going to have complications after but what it does mean is as has been found out in Scotland recently possibly yesterday if you've been consented my darlings you cannot sue that's all i got to say thank you for listening thank you for listening yes um you get by all means i mean you're quite happy for me i've got some various things that i want to talk about and i i'm sorry if there's any crossover because there certainly will be in some ways um i'm sort of um, here to support mm. my wife really and, and the Welsh um, Mesh uh, Supporters Group but I'm also a GP, or at least I'm a recently retired GP and therefore I think I'm in a sort of unique position in that um, I'm the partner of somebody who suffered with Mesh for 16 years and I actually dealt with patients myself who presented to me when I was ignorant of Mesh and subsequently when I knew more about it. If, in, I, I mean, if I really don't mind, I will read what I've got here, but I won't read it as a, a sort of verbatim. I, I know that over the last few months, you've heard innumerable horror stories about patients who've had mesh inserted and the complications that it can cause. And our story isn't any different. Jemima's given birth to four beautiful boys and had several miscarriages, so it's not surprising that she developed some stress human incontinence after that. And she managed it very well to start off with, but when she actually uh, had uh, incontinence during intercourse, she became very upset, understandably, and wanted to go and see someone to get it sorted out. Being in the medical profession, I actually knew many of the local gynecologists because I trained in Cardiff as well. And so I recommended a, as a consultant that I knew very well, I had a lot of respect for, and in order to not sort of um, push ourselves with the NHS, we decided to go privately. So we saw him privately for a consultation. And almost within um, sort of half an hour of us being with him, he suggested that he'd put this wonderful stuff called mesh in, which would solve all the problems. He didn't suggest urodynamics. He didn't suggest referral to a physiotherapist for pelvic floor exercises, none of this. He just said, look, I'll do this, you'll be a new woman. It'll change your life. It certainly did change your life. And it, just has gone on from there. We, about three weeks after the operation, Jemai was in excruciating pain, so we went back to see him, and some of the mesh had perforated through into the vagina, uh, at the vaginal vault. This was, he, he said, oh, no problem, I'll sort that out. Very unusual, never seen this before, you're unique, you know, we'll sort it. So he literally trimmed the bit of mesh off, stitched it back up, and said, go away, you'll be fine now, there'll be nothing else going on. About two months later, Jemima was admitted as an emergency to the District General Hospital, ended up with a laparotomy, where they removed a lot of the vaginal mesh that they could find. And we were actually told by the two senior consultants that were involved in her care that they'd completely removed the mesh. So we went home to my mother's okay for a few weeks, plus a couple of months even. But okay, by okay, I mean she was recovering from major surgery. And then she started complaining of exactly the same symptoms that she'd had previously. But we'd been told that the mesh had been removed. And in my naivety, I said, well, look, it's not there anymore. You know, they've set us out. But because the symptoms got progressively worse, we ended up going back to the hospital, seeing um, the same consultants that we saw before. And after a lot of pressure and a lot of the fact that she was really toxic and unwell and they knew they had to do something, um, she ended up in theatre again. And surprise, surprise, they removed more mesh. 
but again told us now this mesh has been totally removed and that's not just to my wife but this is medical colleagues telling me knowing I was a doctor that they had removed all this stuff from my wife so my still got mesh inside so we were lied to by professionals who I trusted and you know I actually disbelieved my wife and believed them and it caused a tremendous amount of problems. We actually nearly split up because of it. And it's, it, it's actually left, you know, as I say, as Jemima has already said, our youngest son was four year old. He's never actually seen Jemima the way I knew her before he was born. She was a very bubbly, active, physical lady, walked miles, you know. And, you know, if you'd said, I'm going to take the baby out in the pram, literally she would walk four or five miles with the baby in the pram. So she was so active. Now she's on a stick. She can't move. We can't drive for more than an hour before well, she's got I to get out to the time. car. Mm. So, anyway. No, 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 I'm saving now, darling. Thank you. <laughs> um, so, despite my sort of insistence that her symptoms were due to, not due to mesh, I was proved wrong and she was proved right. And in truth, it was Jemima who taught me about mesh. She was the one who researched it. She was the one who got onto the World Wide Web and um, found all these men and women in other countries around the world who were suffering similar problems, even though she'd been told on several occasions that she was unique. And once I became aware of mesh myself and started taking some interest in it, not as much as my wife, you know, because she, or she is suffering the symptoms every day. But I suddenly realized this was a major issue. And so I went to my colleagues. And it just so happened that Jemima was registered with, with my group practice, but not never seen by me, but seen by my, my female colleagues. And because she'd been so ill, she was seen quite frequently. And they thought she was a hypochondriac. And when all this thing about mesh came through, I thought I'll try and enlighten them. I we actually had a, an academic practice meeting and I sat down and I said, right, I'm, I'm going to give you a talk about mesh and tell you how much I know now. And it was like, on deaf ears, they just didn't want to know. It was nothing to do with them. And they felt that this was a gynecological problem and that, you know, as GPs, all they could do was refer the patients on. And if I can get on to that, if I talk my GP hat on for a moment, we all know how busy GPs are. Um, we know they're under great pressure because of workload, they're under financial restraints, and all the other things that go on. I've worked in it for 40 years, so I know. One of my favorite quotes is the difference between a consultant and a general practitioner, which I'm sure you've heard many times, but a consultant who know, knows more and more about less and less until he knows everything about nothing, and a GP is one who knows less and less about more and more until he's nothing about everything. And I only say that just to give an idea of how diverse a GP's knowledge has to be. If you go into an average GP waiting room, I suspect there are very few patients who have the same diagnosis at the end of the day. So your morning surgery, can, 20 patients will all be different, different diagnoses, different disease entities. So, but, so as, a, as for that, the GPs are not gynecologists. They're not surgeons in the main. There are very few gynecologists and surgeons who have gone into general practice. They will have had some training in, in Dobson Gynae whilst they were students and some will have done the DRCOG as I did. But their main knowledge base is gleaned from general practice, from experience within general practice and dealing with these ladies who are coming to see them. But GPs are the first port of call for the majority of patients. And I can, from my own experience, if somebody, if a lady came to me with stress urinary incontinence or pelvic organ prolapse, what would I do as a GP? I'd have a brief examination, I'd make sure that she didn't have a urinary tract infection, all the simple things that you can do easily in practice, but then I would recommend that she be referred to a gynecologist for specialist advice and possible treatment. And when that occurred, a GP would send a letter off to the consultant, and we wouldn't hear from, see the patient for months because the waiting list in the NHS, as you know, are very long in some areas, particularly in parts of Wales. And eventually we'd get a letter from the gynecologist saying, yes, I agree with your diagnosis, this lady has this, I intend to operate, and uh, well, we'll write you again in due course when the operation's taking place. And therefore we wouldn't see that patient again for several months, unless their symptoms had deteriorated. But eventually we'd get another letter, which would say, operation's been done, 
patient has been discharged back to your care, essentially. Not one mention of how, what the, that they put mesh in. Not one mention about any immediate post-operative side effects. These letters, certainly in my experience, until recently, were very brief, and they would just literally told you the minimum. And GPs certainly were never informed that mesh had been inserted. So the, the GPs were ignorant of this fact. So if, somebody, if a lady then came back with early mesh rejection or uh, in the sort of first six to eight weeks post-doc, the GP would do the normal thing. He checked, he checked if they've got a pyrexia, checks if they've got a UTI, possibly do a vaginal swab if they think they've got a, a foul discharge, all these things, and only send them back to the consultant, and then perhaps would treat them possibly with analgesia and antibiotics if they thought it was appropriate. But they would only send them back to the gynecologist if they think there was something wrong with the patient due to the operation itself. And that didn't take place that often because for the, if you treat them, you, you masked things for a while. And, and because the GP didn't know that was mesh or had been, had been inserted, they, mesh didn't even come into their minds. They didn't know anything about surgical technique. They didn't know about the, the materials that were put in. I could guarantee you, if you walked into any general practice in the UK and showed the GP's piece of mesh, very few of them would know immediately what it was. They have no idea. And it's not because they don't want to know, it's because they've never, they don't work in that sphere. And so GPs, in, as a rule, are ignorant of what is going on with the gynecologist in the hospital. And the worst part of it is, when you send the patient back to the gynecologist and say, look, there's something wrong with this patient, they'll do, they often get sent back to the GP saying, well, everything's fine, nothing wrong, don't worry about it. So GPs don't know the early signs of mesh rejection. They don't know the long-term signs of mesh rejection. And as Jemima said earlier, you know, the, um, some patients 16 to 18 years post-operation are getting sort of mesh rejection or the, or the you, know, you know itself, if you've ever seen mesh has been put it's like Bakelite. It gets, and it's brittle. And, and that so therefore creates tremendous problems for the GP who is trying to deal with a patient. And if you think about it, if someone comes back to you 10 years after they've had a, a, a mesh insertion for POP or, or SUI, the, unless they're specifically talking about gynecological issues, then they're not gonna think for one minute it was due to the initial operation. And they, they don't, they, they often come along with, with pain, uh, unexplained abdominal pain, pain in their legs, low back pain, dyspareunia, all these sort of things. And these patients then get sent anywhere but where they should be sent. They go to orthopedics, they go to sort of um, general surgeons, they will go to physiotherapists, but most of them they end up in pain clinic. The majority of these people end up in pain clinic. Mm. And then they get given pain, Killers, they get well. They get analgesics. They get other medications, so, you know, such as amitriptyline and stuff like, which make them worse. And when we had a meeting in, in Parliament a couple of years ago, there was one gentleman there who spoke about his wife, who would actually become toxic because of the medication she was given for her mesh problems, which created, in fact, you know, she was really extremely unwell because she had a, a terrible reaction to these the medication. A lot of people become zombified by yeah. it. So. Again, what I'm trying to get to with all this is that there isn't an excuse for lack of knowledge, but in the GPs, from my GP view, they're not informed of what is going on. And I, I've sort of listed several things here that <laughs> may be relevant. My colleagues in general practice need to be much better informed of the side effects of mesh and a program should be established as soon as possible to educate them. GPs need to be aware of the fact that some mesh operations result in a, a, a side effect rate of 15 to 20%. And that's quoted, that was quoted by Sally Davis herself. And that at least one in 15 women will need their mesh re removed quite early on. Mm. So 
these are the, the things that I sort of plucked out of the air to, to sort of try and enlighten my colleagues a bit more. GP, the names of all patients who have mesh inserted during surgery should be entered on the registry. Well, that's been said by the articles in the BMJ and other journals. It's, and it's now in the new NICE guidelines that this has to happen. Fine, that's good. But GPs are, should be, have that available to them as well. If they ask for that information, they should have it. And in all honesty, it might actually be relevant since we're now sort of sending paperless information to GPs. You can just as easily send that information across with a discharge letter on the patient. So they've got that information available to them. Um, GPs should have open access to the surgeon that's done the operation. There is nothing worse than you phone up about a patient that you're concerned about and you get put through a registrar who's never seen the patient. And the consultant is unavailable. That is not on. We spoke about this in Cardiff. That the, in my day, when I first came in, and I know it's a Cyril's day, we had a very great sort of camaraderie between the GPs, the consultants, the local consultants. You knew them all. They knew you. You're on first name terms. But it made life so much easier for the patients because you would... You, you wouldn't sort of break down pre uh, confidential information, but what you could do is say, well, Mrs. Jones, how's she doing? That's all you need to do. And then you can say, well, I'm going to send her back to you. Is that okay? You know, when can you say it? Because I think it's quite urgent. And that's the sort of thing that used to happen. And patients had much better care that way. Um, I've suggested that GP should possibly have access to urodynamics and physiotherapists for pelvic floor exercises, especially if waiting lists are long because this can be done from general practice as long as they have the access to do it. And that saves waiting for our patients and all the other things that have to be done. Whether that is financially is viable, I don't know. GPs should be encouraged to discuss the consent information leaflets for promote, proposed mesh in surgery with their patients. In order to do this, Effectively, GPs must be aware of the short and long-term complications associated with the use of mesh and how difficult many of those complications are to treat. And they must also be aware that mesh is meant to be a permanent implant. Lots of GPs aren't. They, they're really not. If anything goes wrong with a patient whilst they're in hospital, the GP should be informed immediately, not by a letter which is going to come weeks later. And, and because, again, you, it's after the horse is gone, isn't it? You, know, you, you need to, if you're going to have a, a cohesive treatment of, and, and support for these patients, you've got to know what's going on. If we're going to rectify this tragedy that is MESH, then all health professionals have to admit that there is, it is a major problem, and if we, we must work together to get a positive result out of it. We have to. Unfortunately, I feel that uh, it'll be some time before this happens. I think many surgeons and gynaecologists do not support the suspension of mesh, mm. and they certainly don't support a ban. And this appears, and, and they appear to consider the side effect rate of up to 20% to be acceptable, as far as the use of mesh is concerned. And unfortunately, even the new NICE guidelines suggest that the continued use of mesh is acceptable if non-surgical treatments are attempted first. I'll come on, if I may, to on to the new guidelines afterwards. <sighs> My own view is that it is not acceptable to risk patient life by inserting mesh for non-life-threatening illnesses such as POP and SEY. It, is, it seems illogical to me when we know that we've got this. Another analogy. Um, if a car manufacturer were to place a component in a car that they knew was going to fail in 5% of cases, not the 20% that we're talking about with mesh, and, likely, and then it would likely cause serious injury or death to the passenger, what would happen? There'd be a public outcry, mm. enormous sanctions and fines would be laid on, on the manufacturer. But that's exactly what we do with mesh. Every time we insert mesh, we're actually taking a risk with the patient's lives. And, you know, you know from the information that you've been given that that is actually true. The, f the figures that the MHRA and NICE and all of them have got from uh, their statistics are useless because it's never been recorded properly. Mm. And that's the biggest issue that we've got. You have the figures that they give for side effects are all guesswork. But they're not really because 
I, I remember we sat in, in, in the Scottish Parliament and the MHRA came to speak to the Scottish Parliament and he said we have only two cases this is the, the gentleman from the <laughs> MHRA so we have only two cases reported with oh, side effects against, me, uh, against mesh and behind them were 40 women sitting mm. all had mesh injuries and he was laughed out of the Parliament mm. not only by the women but by actually by the, the, by the, 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 by the Parliament yeah. so what my wife said about the MHRA not being uh, fit for purpose is probably true in many ways unless Just they start, start sorting things out um, okay. Um, my wife sort of touched the fact about the financial aspects that the mesh uh, sufferers are going through, and you know, mesh has, uh, has a lot of implications in our own family. As I've said, you know, I didn't know how bad he was and how how passionate he was about what had happened to until we actually asked him to write it down um, and if you read his submission you'll be touched um, lots of patience yes. oh i do apologize can i just therefore we'll leave we'll leave if you could leave that with us i will leave this with you can i just have this one quick yes. thing on the new guidelines because yes. this this really has concerned me greatly the new proposed um guidelines uh, where are we where are we where are we I apologize I'm right here we go I like the thought that there's gonna be special um, uh, assessment and treatment centers the uh, dash I do apologize I've lost my track here <coughs> what I was going to say is, if, just one last point, is the MESH guidelines, uh, the, the new guidelines that are coming out from uh, NICE are not fit for purpose. I think they give a green light to surgeons to keep putting MESH in. If you actually look at the surgical procedures that they recommend for SEOI and POP, once the people have gone through the non-surgical treatments, when you get to the end, there are three options and, uh, for SEOI. One of them is the insertion of a MESH sling. And if you look at the pop ones, if you retain the uterus, there are three, and there's one mesh in that, and there's, and there's one mesh if you decide to remove the uterus. They sling all these operations together if, if they are comparable, if they're all a, a good option. But what NICE has done there is at the end it says if the surgeon, if, if the patient chooses a, medical a surgical procedure that the surgeon that she has seen can't perform, then she has, she can ask to be referred to another surgeon. Mm. How many patients, if they've gone through the whole process of the non-surgical treatment and everything else for their SUI, are then going to say, oh, well, I'm going to have another surgeon because you can't do what I want to do. Mm. Patients aren't that well informed. Mm. And the mesh is continued to be put in and it's going to continue to cause problems. Can I just ask something about those nice guidelines? Because there's something which I didn't quite understand. There didn't seem to be any thing I could find saying that uh, you must be careful not to say put it through the operator fossa you shouldn't put it in if you can't get it out did, did you no did well, you I haven't seen that, that? I haven't seen yeah, that. yeah I think I think I, I think I mean they, they have said that there are certain procedures that there's no longer to recommend haven't they yeah uh, mm -hmm. and that and that's one of them and porcine mesh but they've, they've uh, the, the, the other thing is that um, it's patients are not going to um, that's where it's going to get to if you look at that, pro that paper yeah. it's about 45 yeah. pages long Tears the four. last 14 of, of 13 or 14 pages are entirely on mesh complications and how the surgeon should treat them mm -hmm. there's not one on natural tissue so are you going to respond to the concept? Well, they said it's too late now because the, the date was yesterday that we could respond. The nineteenth. The nineteenth. I did put some because Jane Hurt, my AM, uh, wrote to me and asked uh, um, some questions, and so I wrote to her. Um, you know, after we had we'd read through it and we discussed a few things, but as stakeholders, I didn't think that we could actually write 
in, in, uh, to express our um, concerns or indeed our recommendations and so we put that forward you know to our to the Welsh Government um, in the email to my AM but um, can I just say to finish that surgeons really really need to take more care they need I have to stand up sorry they need to write down legibly because reading through some of my notes you cannot understand what has happened the notes need to be more comprehensive in what they have done either to put the mesh in or to remove it because never once was I told that my iliac artery had been perforated and stapled and that my colon was accidentally stapled and my ureter to the pelvic wall and the nerve had become trapped never once and they sent me for a colonoscopy whilst that had happened whilst I was all stapled up like this they cannot remove those staples from my iliac artery nobody ever told me anything about that I, I was told that I had some bleeding and I had to have quite a transfusion um, if, I can, if I can just read this out briefly, it's very quick I had a text from one of our, well so Cyril actually met her in Cardiff and spoke to her and came and spoke to her afterwards that she had to have surgery last week. This is what I'm saying, we need more care. She says, it was scary times going down into theatre, scary times though, as just as I was about to have my anaesthetic, he said to me, so, you having done what you had done last year then she had undergone an operation the year before uh, uh, to have mesh removal and they couldn't find the mesh and so it had to be abandoned because she was bleeding I said no I had mesh removed from my bladder last year but they couldn't find the rest and he was confused at this time someone came into the room from the theatre all gammed up and said to me so you're having bladder and bowel repair then today again I said no as I had told Mr. so and so I only wanted my bowel done as I would put up with how my bladder was and I didn't want it touched I panicked at this stage and the anaesthetist said I'm not going any further until this gets sorted and then someone went into the theatre to check with Mr. So-and-so, who then confirmed it was just bowel. You can imagine by this time I was scared to death, as just about to be sent to sleep. The lack of communication is appalling and should not have been an issue. Good job I had my wits about me on that day. It's appalling. That's absolutely appalling. And more care has to be taken and that's all I've got to say thank you very much thank you very much for hearing sorry, us sorry to go over on time. and on and over time um, you started off Jemima talking about urgent action is needed yes. well you will appreciate in England and unfortunately we only cover England we have taken some action which was the pause that yes this, you know yeah, and we so really, really appreciate that. yeah so you know we're not here just um, as a bureaucratic oh. organization we have actually taken action yes. and we're thinking about further action that yes. we need to take that's so I wonderful. thought but I mean I know that won't help you but well, it I think will that the Welsh you. government have to follow suit I, I just want future patients exactly. not to have to go through what we have yeah. been through and I want the patients that have been damaged by this to be to be treated and to be treated with compassion yeah. well, thank you, so. thank you. I, I shall leave, I leave this with you I yeah. leave this could you Dennis could you please yep. Yep. thank right. you thank you very much thank indeed you. thank you very much